we're going to do we've got revelation everybody okay bella please read from tell us where we're reading so people reading revelation one four okay grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from jesus christ who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his god and father to him be glory and power forever and ever amen but he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierce him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. so shall it be amen i am the alpha and the omega says the lord god who is and who was and who is to come the almighty amen alpha and omega start of the greek alphabet end of the Greek alphabet. One who is, always is. The is, the, the thing that is and always is. The beer, the one who gives being. It's really, really cool. Um, mathematics does marry um, theology at that one point. Is that you can't have mathematics. Hi, Shaw. I missed you earlier. How's it going? Um, is that there comes a point when you reach, when you try to oblivion, you know, you try to abstract something into oblivion. And it reaches a point, you can't define everything because there needs to be a definer. And human beings who are created can't be definers, so to speak, in terms of uh, the whole mathematical system. So there will reach a point if you ever pursue mathematical studies. I would love it if you did, that'd be fun. Uh, further. Uh, but there comes a point in both algebra and set theory when you're confronted with the God question in a very un unsuspecting way. So that's a fun thing. I always like to think about that. Scripture is obviously first for, you know, uh, those kinds of purposes, but I find ways. There's always a little bit of math in everything. How's it going, Agnew? You're on time. Okay, everybody. Actually, Agnew and Jacques. Agnew's going to give one go. Jacques's going to give one miss. Wow. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you come in three minutes late every single day. <laughs> one goal, help him out. What's our, what's our one goal here? Glorify God. Yes, glorify God. God. And our mission? Excellent. Hi, Jelton. How are you? What's the goal of mission? What's the goal of mission? Yeah, Diego, what is the goal of mission? Uh, the goal is to glorify God and then the mission of excellence and the heart of Well, obedience. That's the more important part. <laughs> okay, right, the first Samuel 15 for that. Okay, a few reminders involving the exam and also D2L. Raise your hand if you honestly check news, like your D2L shell and your news announcements. Okay, then some of you would have seen an absolutely quality banger meme about yes. the national blogging. Yes. Yes. So that was kind of my litmus yes. test to see who's been, who's been actually checking those news announcements. Because let's just say it happened every single semester. I post important information about the exam review or something. And then I get four people running into me on campus and they say, Scout, when is the exam review? And I say, oh, <laughs> it's almost like I posted it on the well. <laughs> and so obviously it's okay. But just like there comes a point. Just if you have logistical questions, I'm OCD enough that all the information you actually need will already be there before you ask the question, okay? So refer to D12 first. And then if there's something I actually missed, let me know. Um, there's gonna be, I'm not gonna let you have a formula sheet for the exam. Now here's here, here's why. It's first of all, after about three years of running some statistics on stuff, having a formula sheet decreased um, the actual overall class grade by approximately half a letter grade. Um, because when you're allowed to have formulas, um, you, you for some reason you think, oh, the crutch will do the work for me. And so then you just don't practice anything. Okay. By the time you practice for the exam, you won't even need the formula sheet. In theory, if you still don't know how to use the formula by the time you get to exam, tap help. Because you're probably not going to get a very good grade. Okay. So make sure you're coming prepared. Don't come with an exam formula sheet. Don't write it with a Sharpie on your skin. Okay. Nothing, none of that. Just make sure you practice the problems in the exam review. I'm going to show you what kinds of skills you need to know so it's not a shot in the dark, okay? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. If I'm to tell you, these are skills I expect you to be able to do, and then you show up and be able to do it. Sound good? Okay, so no tricks, no games here, but it will be more straightforward. I will anticipate a, a level of excellence 
um, that's going to be, you know, we're a 300 level math class now, okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a mention of your assignment. Do you have a location for your right i'm going to kind of take over the i4 lab over the on that saturday <laughs> and uh, i'll probably record it but also the nature is i'll also use monday to go over pretty much because we'll have multiple days for the review so if people can't make it to the weekend it's fine they, they, they won't really miss anything or yeah so shot. Exam location, do we do it here instead of another in the computer lab oh okay. you're very correct yeah, well, so I think they're funny. using this classroom though at that time. So, I mean, you can try. If they, if they let you use this classroom, then that'd be better than yeah. this. No, no, for the exam. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be better. But I don't know. I might, I'll might. i try to find a better update for the exam. Oh, yeah. I the Oh, yeah. okay. So then, yeah, make sure you're checking the news items on D2L, et cetera. Um, important information for the rest of the time being. If it's important enough that you need to know it for your grade or something in the class, it'll be there before you ask me about it, okay? Makes sense. So if you have a question about logistics, go to the news item page for the content. It will be there. Okay, this is, this is a special day. Um, because curvature, this this lecture on 14.5 for curvature and normal vectors was the very first lecture I ever gave um, in Calculus 3 two years ago. This is the third time I'm presenting this lecture while being a student at Oral Roberts University. And I have, a, I have I turned it into a tradition. I take a, I take a picture with the class that I teach this lecture every single year that I teach it. So I'll make sure we get us out. I'll finish the lecture a little bit early so we can get a class picture for yeah. for the teaching journal. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's here's we go. We got curvature and normal vectors. And leave it up to the mathematicians to not be satisfied with just curvature being curvy. And we need to find a way to calculate and model what curviness actually means. So I'm going to show you two curves, OK? So here's one, and here's two, OK? So this is one, and this is curve number two. Now, just intuitively, because you're all human beings, which one of these curves is curvier? Number one. Number one. Yeah, one's got more curvature than two. And if I asked you to justify that, you might say, well, just use your eyeballs. And that would be a perfectly fine explanation because what's happening is this is a lot more curvature than something that's kind of flattened out, okay? Now, we have found a way mathematically to actually start rigorously talking about what we really need. We can quantify curvature um, as a scalar quantity. And then we can also turn it into a function with respect to two parameters. The first is depending on where you're at on the curve. And then also as a parameter of time to make it easier to actually do practical calculation. So are we all good with this? Just the intuitive idea of what we're actually doing. All of what we're going to do today is essentially talking about how we, how we you know, numerically actually describe what we mean in quantifying curvature on um, parameterized curves. Okay, I need to clear some space. Everybody, I know you take notes, but this is the kind of thing that you really want to have down in your paper. So we'll construct this together. Everybody draw, so give yourself a starting point. And then what we're going to do, just draw kind of a, a, a curve, something like this, that we want to call, okay? Doesn't have to be exactly that, but just make sure it's not a flat line, that'd be pretty boring. And then I want you to label our starting position. This is at, at very, very start, we've accumulated no arc length. So S for arc length is zero at this point. We've accumulated no arc length. We haven't gone anywhere. And what's going to happen is let's travel along and choose. Now, remember when I talked about the unit tangent vector? In other words, it's tangent to the curve and it's got a magnitude of one. So let's take a point and then here is T of s, right? So here's our unit tangent vector, and this s is really measuring, we think of it as a function, where this is the input, right? So this is the arc length s. So this is arc length s. So do we understand what this actually is a function of? 
is as this unit tangent is going along, we're determining which direction it should be pointing in. We're determining what that vector is based off of how far we've traveled along our curve in space. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we're using S because here S is equal to zero. And then by the time we've traveled along and, and accumulated arc length up to this level, we've accumulated S amount of arc length. So we get the unit tangent vector with S amount of arc length down the way. Thumbs up if we meant know what this input means, why there's S for arc length as the variable. Okay. So now, just as we do with all calculus things, we're interested in change. So what's going to happen is let's now see what happens a little bit down the way when we're, we're tracing. So give yourself another dot on the other side. And this is also going to be a unit tangent vector. But this time, we're going to have added a little bit of arc length. So that means from here to here is some delta s. Okay, so we've added a little bit of arc length. So here is just arc length s, but then if we nudge it over some change in the arc length, now we're just simply evaluating what that direction is going to be with the original starting point and then shifting it over delta s. All good with that. I have one question. I know for the uh, tangent vectors or, or um, position vectors, you need uh, time is in the place of where the s is. So it, does s serve as, could it serve as time as well, or is it a different amount of That's a very good question. That motivates actually why we're going to come up with a formula for time. Because you are right. <laughs> this is not time. This is taking a variable that is the arc length itself. So as of right now, we're motivating the concept by using the arc length as we travel along as the input, but there's a, there we'll use the chain rule in a second to then convert a formula so then we can do it in terms of time because that's the practical side of the computation is because you'll want to be able to just have the parameter t and then be able to perform your derivatives and such with this. So don't worry too much about computing stuff with the arc length because this is really the focus, but it's important to motivate why we have the definition as we do. Does that clarify that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to now kind of isolate. Notice that these two were looking at the part of this curve where it actually, well, curves. And so let's take a look at the vectors, the tangent vectors in isolation. So here's the T of S. And then I'm going to kind of do head to tail or tail to tail here. And here is the vector S plus delta S, right? That's just taking them out and putting them together. And so what happens is, let's see, notice that this is the overall change in direction, right? So in dotted, this overall change in direction, if you remember from 13.1, the very first section with vectors, is that we can actually describe this vector as a difference. It's really taking the further along vector, which is S plus delta S, and subtracting away the vector from the initial place, right? So this dotted line that goes from top down to bottom, I tried to draw the arrow there, that vector is the difference between T S plus delta S and then minus T of S. So far, so good. So all we've done is we've drawn a curve, we've taken a look at the unit tangent at one point along the curve, we've moved it over, we've pushed it over, we took out another direction. We're now only interested in those changes of direction, and that difference now is showing us by how much um, we've changed the direction of the unit tangent vector. All right, is that all good? Mm -hmm. So do you have this constructed on your note paper? Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're gonna move towards constructing the formulas. So I clarify this because I'm gonna clear it all. So we all have a copy of it that you can reference back and forth to. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know how much of Calc 1 you guys remember. I'm not entirely optimistic, but I think it'll be good enough. So we're going to define, so defining curvature as an instantaneous fancy math word you've seen before. 
rate of change. So an instantaneous rate of change should immediately signal what familiar concept to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Differentiation, instantaneous rate of change. Now we construct this idea of instantaneous rate of change by taking an average rate of change first and then do perform limiting behavior on this average. So let's take a look at what this average difference is, right? Earlier, refer back to your little diagram that you had the zeros, that average change was taking that vector difference t s plus delta s minus t of s. And then now, over what amount of arc lengths did that occur? Well, we nudged it over delta s. So that is the average rate of change. So this is not instantaneous yet. This is simply the average. And then we're going to perform limiting behavior on this. And then that's going to turn it into an instantaneous rate. And so in a very, very analogous way to how Calc 1, that little change, the amount we nudge over by, if we just shrink that down indiscriminately to some infinitesimally small amount, we can get an instantaneous rate of how the direction of this vector is changing. And so we can do that with a limit. So we'll simply take, we're defining this derivative of dt with respect to, we're still in our length. We're about to translate it over to time, but we're still in our length. And this is going to just be the limit. So we're limiting, we want that chunk of s that we took. If you look at the diagram, that was a really big delta s, so that's not very precise. But if you were imagining you're pushing it, you're shrinking it down so it gets really, really close to how it's changing, that's going to approach zero. All we're really doing is it's still this exact same relationship the entire time. This doesn't change. So very analogous construction to doing calc one when we look at the limit definition of the derivative. I thought it was really funny. Um, I'm going to be lecturing in calc one later, like right after this. And they're constructing the definition, limit definition of derivative. So it's like, yeah, it's perfect. The Cal 3 students are going to be taking a review of pit stop here. Yeah. So this is the derivative. I, I, I'll just put this here for the sake of it. Limit as h does zero of x plus x minus x over h. So that has that's that's basically being echoed in analogy. We have different symbols now. It looks a little bit different, but the concept is pretty much the same. Okay, so now we can define what we really mean by curvature here. So definition, DEF dot. So let R describe a smooth parametrized Curve. I've been doing this for three years, and I still sweat when I get to the T and the R. So is there an E in there, or is it just metrized? metrized. And then if S denotes arc length, so again, to stay on line with your question, Jock, we'll define it with respect to arc length first, and then we take that definition, we move it over to the parameter. The notes are blank. And just because it's a new concept and you might have forgotten, remember that when we construct a unit tangent vector, it's pretty much exactly how it sounds. It's a, a tangent vector, but made into a unit vector. So it's r prime over the magnitude of r prime. Don't forget about that. This is the unit tangent vector. Then the curvature, is what we're defining here, curvature is, and then here's the formula with respect to arc length. We use kappa. It's not a K because, yeah, the little leg comes down off of the first one. Kappa of S is equal to the magnitude of this rig, dt dx. Now, why do you think it's magnitude instead of just the derivative itself? Why do you think that we define the curvature to be the magnitude of this instantaneous rate of change instead of just the instantaneous rate of change by itself? And I'll ask you this question. When you get into your car to go driving and you want to know the speed from it, is your direction relevant? No, there's a scalar. Yeah. This is going to spit out a scalar. So by putting the absolute value bars around the vector, we're guaranteeing that what's going to come out is a scalar quantity. 
we're interested in magnitudes here. We're measuring the magnitude quantity of something. So this change that's happening, we just want the size of that change, and that's going to give us curvature. We're going to talk about other things involving direction, because the moment you stick a parameterized curve into three dimensions, suddenly left and right isn't sufficient to fully capture all the different kinds of directions. Yes. So is it T of, well, let's see what's in the bracket? Uh, the one. Here? Yeah. That's T of just T. T of T. Right, because remember, the unit tangent vector is defined by, uh, it's a it's parameterized with T. Uh, what was the name of the yeah? Okay. This is okay. Oh, yep. <laughs> yeah, it's like when you see all the Zana societies like we're Kappa Mu S or whatever, right? Okay. Um that's the lowercase version. The uppercase version actually is like an in the in the, the same in English with a capital K, but the lowercase one is Q. Okay. Yeah, this is a lowercase kappa. I think lambda, lowercase lambdas are the Q, are really, really cute as well, which is good because we use those a lot later. Okay, yeah, we have all this written down. Because now we're going to shift it over to the actual interesting stuff, which is now parameterized T. So, I'll take this off. I like this section because it's the first time we get to do something that's not entirely just calc one analogous because calc one people are stuck in the plane. Mm -hmm. We get space now we can play with. Okay, so we're going to go back to a good old familiar chain rule, right? Chain rule. Try to draw a colon, but it didn't look like it. Yeah, there we go. So here's how this is going to work. We want the parameter with time. That's the main issue. We don't have a way to relate that with time. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the chain rule to do this expansion, where we have dt with respect to time. And then we're going to have this product. It's going to be the TDS. So this is what we have just talked about with respect to curvature. And we're multiplying it with DS DT. In other words, we, we do this. So this is the chain rule to get us back to this parameter with respect to T. So if we have the TDS, which is related to curvature, we need to cancel the DSs, essentially. You can visually think about that, how the chain rule works. So that's the most case DM right? This is lowercase. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so one vector and three vector that standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the only vector value things, the capital T, so the only vectors. So then what's, what the, the trick is, we technically know what this is, so let's isolate it. So if I divide both sides of the equation by the ds dt and get, notice that that would put all of the t-related parameters on one side. So I can simplify, I could say that dt ds, the only thing involving um, getting respect to the arc length, we can have dt with respect to t divided by this guy, so the ds with respect to dt. Did everyone see that? So basically, we're just pushing him over here. Okay, so all of the stuff with respect to t is now on one side. And now that we've isolated this, we know that the magnitude of this specific derivative actually is how we define its curvature. That's why we needed to define curvature first. So that when we take the magnitude of this, the magnitude of dt over ds, and we can take the magnitude of both sides, so that'd be the magnitude of dt over dt. <laughs> it starts to sound confusing, like if you just say it out loud without seeing it, because we use a lot of the same letters, but d, capital T, the vector with respect to the parameter, d. And so now we can simply substitute kappa in here, right? So we get kappa, the curvature, Oops. Okay, kappa. Notice that it's going to be with respect to t now. So this is this is the goal because now we'll be have a we'll have a way to just directly compute these. This is really don't get confused with the Leibniz notation since we have fractions. Leibniz is really ugly, so this is really just capital T 
prime with respect to the variable t. So it's magnitude of vector t prime with respect to p. And then what do you what how how would we convert this Leibniz into Newtonian there? It's gonna be oh it should be Lagrangian actually sorry it'll be um, S prime goes well prime. so here's where we're gonna do a substitution. When you take the absolute value of arc length from calc, I think it's from calc two you talked about this at least at OU, where you where you can substitute this magnitude with the speed essentially. Oh. So if you remember that. I, I can't remember which chapter that's talked about. But the magnitude of that rate of change of the arc length with respect to time gives you just this. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So these two are going to be the same. And then technically, since we're interested in, we're going to usually be given a curve that's given by like R, then you could really just write this as T prime of T and then magnitude. R prime. So if there's a formula you want to commit to memory to practice, is this one right there? That's the most useful one. So this is the change in the curvature of the sign over the uh, is velocity all of the things. So to speak. Um I would in terms of if you're trying to make Visual interpret like visually interpret that. I would actually use the arc length the version of the formula. This is just a re-expression of the arc length formula. But the arc length formula actually highlights what's really changing with respect to what, whereas this is more just a co computationally efficient form. So this isn't this this form here isn't designed to be like enlightening what you're really physically representing. It's more just for I'm having a really handy dandy algorithm because no, to get t, you're going to need r prime, which means that you are going to have to, by nature, build some of the pieces to get the formula going in order to even fit it. So there is an efficient way to get through this. We'll work through a full example of it. And we're going to prove something that you already know to be obvious. We're going to prove that lines have zero curvature. Mm. <laughs> so I didn't know that. Well, you know, Can we prove you this? never know. Okay. So here's the how we. Oh, by the way, if you haven't already boxed this, box this, store it, have it in a way that you can actually access it. Good note taking isn't just having written it down somewhere, it's being able to find it later when you need it. It's like people who save their receipts when they go to Walmart. You know, it's just like, you, <laughs> there's only really two kinds of people there. The people that are so OCD to the point where they actually just like document everything or they just collect a bunch of receipts in their glove compartment, okay? So don't let this be glove cook. Don't be a glove compartment note taker, especially with formulas. OCD. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for the lines, let's just use R, P. We can use that really standard form for this. Let's say X naught plus A, P, Y naught plus E T Z not but C T. And notice I'm not going to specify a restriction on T, so I just want this line to go from minus infinity to positive infinity. Okay, so if we want to find the curvature of a line, then we have a formula that makes it readily accessible to compute with respect to time, which is good because that's what we have. We have on. So if the formula is going to require our prime, common sense says, let's get our prime. So what is R prime going to be? One more time for everybody, Rebecca. A, B, C. Yeah, A, B, C, A, B, C. Because there's, these are very, very simple derivatives. Okay. And that shouldn't be all too surprising because that, that, you know, the rate of change is the direction of your line. Okay. Now we have our prime. Mm -hmm. But the formula means the magnitude of our prime. Mm -hmm. So let's find what the magnitude of our prime is. Square root yeah. of a square plus b square plus c squared. Okay, so we're squaring each of the individual components and adding them all up together in a linear combination. So we got square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Okay, cool. So can we plug into the formula right now? No. no. We got to find the t-bill first. So do you remember how T was defined? What is T? What's the name? 
Say its name. Unit yeah, unit tangent vector. Here's our tangent. So it's going to be r prime of e over the magnitude of r prime of e. So here's what I'm trying to get to you. Is we're working through this example is because I'm modeling for you the most efficient way to use all your work. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you find r prime first and you find the magnitude right next, you've set yourself up to plug and chug straight into the unit tangent. You're ready to go. So then you can throw that in there. So then we get a b c over the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Now I'm not going to really simplify that uh, because that's a pretty good way to to have it. <laughs> Some people, I, I remember the first time I saw somebody go, like they made the vector and they went a over the square root of a squared plus b squared plus b squared, and then comma b over <laughs> the square root of a squared. And it was tedious. You know, I was, it wasn't wrong, but it was tedious. Okay, so now that we have the unit tangent vector, we're interested in its derivative. If we're interested in its derivative, that means we should probably differentiate. So t prime. Here's my question for you. A, B, and C, what are, are those variables or all those constants? constants? Interesting. So every single component in this vector is a constant and we're differentiating. So what vector are we going to get here? Zero. Yeah, zero vector. Notice that I did not put just zero there. Because if I would have put zero there, then I'm claiming that a vector is a scalar. You oh. can't do that, okay? This zero vector is really, I'll put in parentheses what this is really communicating. In R3, because that's how many dimensions we have, it's saying we have zero in every single one of the um, components. But instead of writing all of that out, that's what's implied by using the shorthand. Okay. So then here's T prime. Now the magnitude, if we have the zero vector, this is you know the most difficult part. What's the magnitude of the zero vector? Zero. zero. Yeah, the magnitude of t prime so it's scalar zero. Okay, see the difference. The t prime vector is the zero vector. The magnitude, so basically scalar size is zero. Differentiate between those two because it's important. Okay, now do we have all the ingredients yes. to find our kappa? Right, so kappa. With respect to t, is the magnitude? Did I hear someone say weight? That's a good question. So a, b, and c. What are those? Are those variables or constants? Constants. Diego, what's the derivative of constant? Zero. Ah, uh, we take it again because we're taking the derivative of that. Yep. All good. Cool. But then we had zero, zero, zero for all the components for the zero vector, mm -hmm. and then further we wanted the magnitude. So then the magnitude of the zero vector is just scale with zero. Um, okay? okay. And now what we're doing for the last step is we're simply plugging in all the pieces that we've built. So it's the, gonna be the t prime t over r prime t, which is zero, zero oh. over the square root a squared plus b squared. Square 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 square. Yep. But that's just gonna go to Zero. And so now we go to the question of why did we go through all that work to compute it? Prove that lines are not curvy. Right. But what does the number zero have to do with the line having no curvature? The rate of change is zero. The rate of change. Right. Yeah. The very measure that we have, the function kappa that's going to tell us at every single time t how much curvature is happening is always going to be zero, regardless. Where you're at. Okay, cool. So that means lines are never going, there's never going to, you can trust that as you go to infinity here, you're not going to have a line that's going and then it goes, ah, and then, <laughs> right? Because if it, if it would have done that, we would have seen something that's not just the scale of zero. You see what I'm saying? So this is, this gives you a lot more, um, a, it's a lot more powerful of a tool and a result, even if it seems pretty obvious. Okay. So this, this idea that we can completely describe. The whole curvature with respect to where you're at in time is a really powerful idea. So yeah, lines go to zero. So I'm going to give you an example problem that you're going to take. Oh, if you're going to come to the exam review, I anticipate you prepare that as kind of like your pre pre up for that. Can you show? Can you convince me using the definition of curvature, basically? 
that circles, what, what do you, what kind of curvature do you think circles have? Well, I'm not going to answer it right now, but you'll figure it out, right? So work through the text, work through some problems, and really think about that, right? So if curvature is a function of time, and it's letting you know how much curvature is happening as you continue to trace out the curve, what kind of curvature do we, should we anticipate circles to have? And then if you could show that. And then go further. You know those are the, the fun little slinky toys that kind of go like that? Well, what about that curvature? Is it going to be the same as a circle's curvature? Or if we're stretching it out in three dimensions, is that going to affect anything? Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. I don't want to tell you. Oh, because you will find it out. It's way more fun to find it out uh, than meets someone down. So if this is in your notes, you're looking pretty good for exam review. This is in your notes. You're looking pretty good for exam review, but you're not going to look as good if we don't go through the textbook and try some other familiar shapes out. Okay. What about an ellipse? Obviously, there's now we've put a little bulge in a circle. So we'd probably anticipate a different result than a circle. So you got to move to a point in mathematics where you're not necessarily just, you know, trying to memorize stuff that I'm giving to you. You have the capacity to do creative work with these ideas. And so that's why I don't like it when people say, that mathematics is, is, is one of the sciences that is so insulting to something that is really just poetry of logic. So if I if I could change one thing about the way STEM is understood, I would make the M in STEM music, and then I would make mathematics an art, because that's really what's going on. Mathematics is not a science. It doesn't apply rea physical reality to model it. Mathematics takes logic and then it plays with it in different symmetries and different things and that's basically poetry so you're a poet you just didn't know it now there are different levels of stubborn and my level of stubborn is i had a postdoc friend who i did some research with over last winter break and she told me it's impossible to derive musical harmony from anything except for the physical reality. So I said, I think you're wrong. And I'm going to spend the next two years of my undergrad doing research <laughs> to prove that you are wrong. It took so, me two days. Well, no, I still got I still got to get from the I'm going to try to build it from the axiom of choice. So I'm going to try to construct basically this idea that you can create that humanity basically has this ability from set theory. And they guarantee the existence of our ability to choose how we define a system of harmony. And then the system of that choice and the covers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have lots of the hardware done past a certain point, but I'm trying to fill in some gaps that preclude the necessity of a physical reality for the structure of music to actually exist. So anyways, if you ever want to talk music and mathematics, I'm always gay. <laughs> okay, there's an alternative curvature formula that I think is kind of a waste of time, but since you're paying for this class, I'll tell you. <laughs> Alternative curvature formula. This is actually, I mean, I'd imagine that you're probably more physics oriented. This might help because the V is now, we're expressing instead of just R's and R primes and T's, we're going to bring it down to like the physical application. So velocity vector cross product with the acceleration vector. If you take that magnitude and divide that, by the magnitude of the velocity, and then cube that magnitude. You want to know why that is the most random formula? There is a derivation in the textbook. It was very disinteresting to me, though, so I'm not going to show it to you. Simple math. Very simple math. <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to do all this work to find curvature, like in reality, and then physics professor will be like, assume the penguin is a sphere. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, well, I could, I could have just thrown like constant curvature, yeah. No, we all know, people think that just because I'm in math, I don't know the physics stuff. We all know that cows are cylinders, that penguins and chickens are spheres. That's just textbook physics. Absolutely. And specifically, if you're going to do if you're going to do air resistance on the cow, use G is none. But if you're going to do a penguin or a chicken as a sphere flying through space because the moose hurled it with initial velocity and you want to figure out where it's going to land, that's going to be G equals 10 for convenience, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
And then the mathematician comes by and he says, G is G. And then answers in terms of G. And then all the calculators break because there's no such thing as G. <laughs> all right. Let's bring it up. We got to get to the normal side of the vector. So that's curvature. Curvature is the, definitely the more important side of this. But I will show you this because it's a very, very beautiful idea. So principal uh, unit normal vector. I remember the first way I applied this as a freshman was navigating Saga most efficiently. So I have optimized pretty much all of the tile roots post chapel. So you can use this if you really feel like it. So here's N and it's notice that we're going to start by defining it with the arc length before moving into like the parameter. So it's consistent. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to take that derivative dt ds and divide by the curvature, which is the magnitude dt ds. So if you see the parallels in here, which is this idea of taking a derivative, dividing it by the magnitude of itself. Immediately, you should know, if you recognize abstractly what's going on, how what is, what's the magnitude of this always going to be? Cool. Yeah, exactly. Because we took a vector, and we're now dividing that vector by its own magnitude. So uh, all of those arc lengths is always going to be magnitude of one. So that's what we mean by principal units, normal vector. And then normal means normal. So we can anticipate the tangent to be unit tangent. We can anticipate the unit normal to be unit normal. So the names of these are intentional and they're not supposed to be uh, misleading. If you really wanted to uh, apply the definition here, you could say that we have one over kappa times ETDS, but that's a little tedious. So if you don't like that, I agree with you. Um, now for parameters, so it's the actual useful thing that you'll use for parameters, we're gonna describe the unit normal vector NMT. Notice that we're interested in our parameter T. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the derivative of the unit tangent vector and divide it by the magnitude of itself. So again, very, very similar construction. We're taking the derivative with respect to its thing, dividing it by itself, so we're guaranteeing that it has a magnitude of one all the time. And there is a caveat. Notice that if we're dividing by curvature, this doesn't work on a line, because a line has how much curvature? Zero. Can we divide by zero? No. no. So we just specify as a kind of like a legal caveat that kappa can't be zero. And so long as kappa is not zero, then this is going to check out. Well, I, I put it in Leibniz. So yeah, you could put this as T prime oh, of S if you want. Yeah. But it's more for the parallelism between the curvature and the curvature. Okay. There's a few properties. There's really only two properties that we need to know that we know for normal. The rest of it is kind of not really necessary for now. Is that if we take our unit tangent and our unit normal, I'd ask that we all take a moment to use common sense. What's that dot product always going to be? Two. Yeah. Because to be normal to a tangent, okay, basically you've given a vector that's defined to always be orthogonal to another. So in the same way that when we were doing like that circle issue with the centripetal acceleration, that acceleration is always going to be pointing, you know, in the opposite direction of the position which is exactly uh, tangent to, or not tangent, sorry, orthogonal to the velocity. So it's a similar kind of a situation. We got a tangent and this normal is kind of acting, I don't want to say centripetally because that's technically incorrect, but if you intuit the idea of what this vector in its direction is doing, it's kind of similar. So that's always going to be zero. Is this a scalar or a vector on the right side? Scalar. Why is it a scalar? Uh, uh, Okay. Why? Yeah, and, then, and then now you see why we had to put right magnitude bars around the v cross a. Because what's v cross a by itself? So, so vector. Is kappa a vector? No. no. So that's why we put the the absolute value bar. Okay. Here's another property that you need to know. And this is the most important part of this concept of unit norm. So if you get this, you've got what you need for the unit. So the unit normal n it points to the inside of the curve in the direction that the curve 
is turning. So the moment you introduce curvature to a curve, that means it has to curve in some direction. You can't have curvature and without there being a direction that you're turning into. And so n is going to point toward that direction. It's always going to guide where are we turning into it. And this is better than calc one where you're stuck with left or right. Because now you're in three dimensions. And so now you can say you need to describe what your direction is, where you're turning with a vector. Now that's in three dimensions. Because there's a whole lot more than just the left and right when you're in R3. So does everyone have this? Yeah. And everyone got above this. So I'm going to erase the top and I'll draw you a little. I'll, I'll explain this later. Everybody get ready to draw. Do a lot of drawing in this chapter. Okay. And so let's just get, actually, you don't have to do this curve. You can do whatever curve you want, so long as it's not a line. Because <laughs> you already know what that's going to turn out. And I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to choose this point to illustrate an idea here. What is the tangent? So the tangent is going to be tangent to the curve. I hope that part is clear from what we've talked about, right? So this is unit tangent. At this very instance, on this particular curve, at that specific point, that is the unit tangent. Now, the normal is going to be normal. There's only two options for that. Is it going to be going up or is it going to be pointing down? No. Right. Why is it going to be pointing down? Inside. Points to the inside of the curve, or you can think of it the direction that we're turning. So if I'm doing, if I'm curving through space and I'm near, I'm curving down, then I'm not going to have my normal going the opposite direction that I'm turning into. So you can kind of think about when you're driving or racing. There's a lots of different math that goes into this kind of stuff. How many of you watch F1 or know what that is? Are you sitting here? Okay. Yeah. This is this is a small, this is the, a very stripped down theoretical base of where they come up with max lines. So the way that that works is that the tires they have different kinds of tires that can grip onto um, the racetrack at different various levels. But then those tires wear out at different speeds depending on how much they're driving and the speed and the terrain that they're going over. And so this, whenever they're navigating a track, they're trying to basically optimize that tangent so that they don't have to continually be breaking around turns and corners, but at the same time, accommodating for the fact that other vehicles are going to be obstructing the way. So it's always an issue of they're interested in this, that unit normal that's always pointing into that general direction that they're trying to get into, um, where their actual velocity is kind of basically going in the direction of that unit tangent. So the op these are going to be scaled differently. And there's a lot more parameters that go into it, but that's just a glimpse. There's so many different ways you can interpret and apply all of this. Uh, so down here, though, then we get up further down the track. So here's our unit tangent. Let's ignore the fact that I blatantly drew a magnitude bigger than there and there. <laughs> Should all just be magnitude of one. Okay, so now where's the normal going to go? Is it going to point down or up? Oh. Right, it's pointing into again. So when we turn here, but now we're turning back. We're curving back in. And now we're indicating that's, that that normal, if you were to compute that with the formula, it's going to always indicate something that's going in the direction What about on the part of the line of space? Where is the normal thing? Where is the normal thing to be at that point? Normal. I'm going to answer oh. your question with a question. When it's straight, temporarily, what shape is that? Mm -hmm. Well, you just proved earlier. How much curvature is going to be in that line? Yeah. Yeah. Can we define the normal vector when that copper was zero? Yeah. No, because that would result in division by zero. So there you go. You just explained. Or yourself. You see what I'm saying? You can interact with the definitions. You can you you can you can do these things on your own. God's given you a brain and he's given you definitions. So you can't use it. You don't have to. No, most people don't. Okay, so up here again, just, just to make sure we really get this. If, if we're now we're at this point, where is the normal gonna be pointing? Um, yeah, there we go. So this can be this is in the plane because this is a whiteboard, and the whiteboard exists in the plane. But if I were to put this into three dimensions, so if you imagine there being kind of like a curve that goes through, or maybe 
how many of you have gone to like you you sat next to the window seat when you're approaching an airport tonight right mm -hmm. and so you see that not always you don't get to just you know shoot straight down into the airport what happens is usually here's your one way and then they have a whole list you have to talk to the tower. <laughs> well, it's terrible. And then <laughs> basically, we're on a plane and you have to wait in queue. So you kind of circle around before you actually make your final descent. So the idea is at this instant right here, your plane's going like this, you're curving in this direction. So curvature can now exist in more than one. So the normal is going to be kind of pointed in towards central around the uh the way you're gonna land but then by the time you arc around to here you're turning into here and then by the time you get to here you're turning into here so it's always going to indicate and multiple times now it's no longer fixed in the plane because you're also kind of here not only are you turning in and down but then you have to shift it a little bit so they can have three directions but it's always going to point exactly in the direction you're turning regardless um, of whether you're stuck in the plane or in a three-dimensional situation yeah, and then wind would add a vector, so then you'd add a vector force to that point, then you'd accommodate for all those things at the same time. So, okay. On a scale of one to two pi, how are we feeling? And then there's half the class that's like, oh, the unit circle, what is that? <laughs> okay. If it's on, let me, let me stop the recording here, because that's the